milk and cookies, mac and cheese, peanut butter and jelly, me and Elma, burgers and fries, salt and pepper, me and Elma, chips and salsa. All of these things work in perfect harmony for a euphoric sensation when paired together. And just like these iconic pairings, the constant tug of war between heroes and villains in anime creates a dynamic contrast that entices the narrative. Much like peanut butter saltiness and jelly sweetness, the opposing forces of good and evil bring out the best in each other, creating a compelling and balanced story. Just like mac and cheese are inseparable and essential to each other. Their interactions, just like milk and cookies, bring a comforting and satisfying balance to the story, making the resolution of their conflict feel rewarding. Okay, I'll be honest, I think I'm just hungry. Just give me a second. All right, it should be good. All right, moving on. This interplay of good versus evil adds depth and complexity to the plot, allowing for character development and moral dilemmas to keep the audience engaged. Heroes are often driven to greater heights by challenges posed by their demonic adversaries, while monsters reveal the resilience and virtues of the heroes they face. This eternal conflict not only entertains but also reflects fundamental truths about the human condition, illustrating the perpetual struggle between our noblest aspirations and our darkest impulses. It's through this ongoing battle that stories find their heart and heroes and villains alike find their true purpose. While the conflict of good versus evil has always been interesting, another aspect of this idea that has intrigued me even further was the different species or races authors use to portray this. As humans, we are pretty accustomed to the idea of war and conflict, but what these fictional settings provide us are mythical creatures. In some circumstances, something that is beyond human comprehension but is still there to antagonize humans. With the inability to really understand these mythical creatures in some cases, and when these mythical creatures start to conflict with our given morals and ideals, it's easy to write them off as monsters. Entities only there to antagonize, ridicule, and destroy our way of life. But in some rare scenarios, the author starts to develop on this idea in immaculate ways. And before I mention some examples, let's first distinguish the difference between a monster and a mythical creature that is only considered monsters by affiliation. Monsters often lack empathy and a moral compass. They don't act on any desire or reasoning and only do things because they are commanded or programmed to do so, like slimes, zombies, and other low-grade creatures you tend to see in fantasy. While there is the occasional outlier, most of these monsters only antagonize and threaten the lives of certain beings with no other thought around it, whether they be for good or bad because they have to, not having the capability to think any further than that. Creatures that are only considered monsters by affiliation on the surface may seem like beings without thought, only there to antagonize a certain group, but the distinguishing difference between these two are instinct and drive. A good example I could refer to is... Jesus, I'm like reading my script and it just sounds more cringy out loud, um, is in, is in Rick and Morty episode 57. In this episode, I'll just let him explain it. But it turns out trouble has a way of following them. Literally every planet with dinosaurs on it is eventually smashed by a huge space rock that takes out them and most existing life. Why would planet killing meteors follow dinosaurs? As these reptiles evolved to higher and higher levels of loving vegan godhood, another life form devolved into an equally selfless, hate-filled species of barely sentient rocks. Everywhere these dinos go, these rocks, they come a-crashing. While these meteors are extremely de-evolved to counteract the dinosaurs, has the instinctual drive and enough intelligence to wipe out and destroy any progress the dinosaurs have done to a certain planet. The fact they have thought and the ability to think on their own is the main aspect that distinguishes the difference between a monster and a creature. Let's put the nail in the coffin and really solidify the difference between a creature and a monster. For this example, I'm going to be using Titans from AOT. No, no, not the important ones, the other ones. Yeah, there we go. These titans, although originally formed through humans, are transformed into brainless creatures, only set on doing one task, eating humans. There's no other thought that goes into this process. Once they turn into a titan, they either turn into abnormals or regulars, set on one task and one task only. Now you may argue that the Rick and Morty reference I mentioned earlier could be related to titans. The main difference between these two examples is the fact that the meteors in Rick and Morty de-evolved to antagonize the dinosaurs. They had a reason to be the mindless creatures they are today, but compared to Titans, they were instantly programmed and set on eating humans, and nothing else. They are basically just giant zombies. Titans are concise and to the point. They antagonize our group of main characters with no other thought behind it, and as the plot thickens, it starts to become less of a threat compared to the beginning of the show. I believe that this is one of the more reliable ways of implementing monsters to a story. They are a threat at the beginning, and they fuck off for the rest of the story. And in anime, there are plenty of shows that go deeper into this concept in very meaningful and impactful ways. 
So today, I wanted to talk about these creatures in a more anime-esque environment and show some instances that I think are good, could be better, and downright out uh. and downright outstanding. But anyways, let's get started. In Jujutsu Kaisen, curses are one of the main antagonists in the series. At first, they are portrayed as mindless creatures, formed from the negative thoughts of humans. Hey, and what? I heard you were talking about Mahito. What? Hello? What? Yeah, you're talking about Mahito, right? Blade. Let me in on this. Come on. I'll let you back inside the house. Shut up. Just. Uh, I kicked you out after that Kurapika video. Look, you just don't understand what true script writing is like. You you have no taste. Now, similarly, you definitely aren't going to give the right take on Mahito, so let me take over here. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. F fuck you. That's what. Wow. <laughs> fuck you. All right, all right. You know, you know, you know, what, you know what I just got? You know what it's time for? What? You got your... You're not going to be able to survive this. <laughs> You're going down. Monster in storytelling is typically used to refer to something that's conveyed to have intelligence, that the audience and characters have to engage with, but kept ambiguous enough so that they don't fully understand what it does or how it works. The story monster made the point that in the real world, those couldn't exist because any person who seems supernatural and incomprehensible would, by definition, probably still have to exist within some kind of physics and their behaviors would follow some line of logic. Whatever complicated circumstances have forced them and their impression to deviate from conventional human traits. But if we engage with a story, then on some level, to be able to process it as a functioning world, any monsters that appear within it would have to follow some kind of system of world mechanics, and their actions would result from logical sequences. So what usually defines a monster in a story is how it's portrayed relative to the storytelling. Unlike the rock humans and vampires from Jojo, the demons from Freerin, or the ghouls from Tokyo Ghoul, which are clearly shown as just being humans put through some decorative filters, or at least demonstrate rational and coherent thinking, better examples of monsters would be Stands from Jojo, Lernan's Golems from Freerin, and Kaneki's Visions in Tokyo Ghoul, although most of Freerin's storytelling does portray its demons as monsters. But one example of making monsters that are as close to human as possible is done in Jujutsu Kaisen. The supernatural stuff in the series comes from cursed energy, which is generated through some process still kept mysterious, expended as extra destruction, and usually preserved for a while because of its tendency to convolute based on its exact method of being produced. Some people are born with abilities to produce cursed energy and convolute it into a specific effect, but others are born without being able to control the cursed energy they produce, and it ends up gathering in places people often produce cursed energy around, concentrating itself to produce small creatures that take on characteristics of any specific details their cursed energy was produced around to gradually expend it through their actions. At the start of the series, it just means there are these animalistic ghost monsters for the humans to fight, but as it progresses, they introduce a character Mahito to make the protagonist Yuji realize that creatures made from cursed energy are also living beings, and some can be comparable to humans too. Mahito is from a group of curses born from such high amounts of cursed energy, produced around such specific things, that each of them has human intelligence and can expend their energy just like a sorcerer's power. However, key details on what kills them for good and what goes on behind their eyes are kept ambiguous so that even the human-like curses are still monsters in the story. The instant Instincts of curses are implied to match the qualities of the cursed energy they're produced from, intending to cause destruction primarily back to the people that produced it, and through the specific things they produced it around. But this trait is portrayed in the story to always subvert attempts at understanding their feelings, and their deeper reasoning is never provided because their biggest source of cursed energy, for their own long-term survival, is humanity, which is what they're all trying to kill. While there are explanations, the story never addresses them, and instead uses these human-like curses to be symbolic of a specific idea, which is how monsters are typically used. In this case, they're drawing the comparison to how sometimes you can't afford to fully understand someone or give them endlessly lenient treatment when you're in conflict with them, and Mahito is the most direct example of this. He's the curse powered by fears of humanity, so he's especially reliant on humans existing, and it's his irrational behavior at the end that manages to get Yuji to break through their impressions of being monsters and see that they share their recklessness. I imagine Mahito was using his power to keep a supply of humans engineered for being livestock somewhere, and all the curses were born with specific traits designed to perpetuate the fears they came from alongside killing people, however that would work. But Mahito was specifically also acting and portrayed as reckless until the very end, so the story could paint him as inhuman for all of that time. 
the only character that really acts rationally in Jujutsu Kaisen is Sukuna, because that's sort of the point of the story. So, the story does this cool thing, where since it's largely about showing a lot of the significant flaws of a lot of humanity, it's able to balance making a group of characters that both succeed at being storytelling monsters and are the exact same as the humans at the same time. How did you become a gang star and take over Pashone? Hey, 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 Giorno, real quick. Say, I, I cook it a pizza! I'm not saying that again. I already said it earlier before the podcast started. In a show called Demon Slayer, it's obvious that zombies are the main antagonists that are portrayed in the series. In order to survive, aside from a certain <clears throat> someone, has to eat human flesh or at the very least drink blood. We could categorize this action as the instinctual need to antagonize humans, and because they are not mindless while doing this action, can further justify them as creatures and not monsters. They have to eat humans in order to survive, just like how carnivores need to eat meat in order to live. What's interesting about the creatures in the show compared to the ones I'll talk about later is how they are born. Demons are birthed when humans consume the blood of another demon. This allows the authors to explore different ideals, personalities, perspectives, and traits for them. Or in other words, all of the upper and lower demon moons. While these demons have the instinctual drive to consume human flesh, they are still able to recognize, relate to, and even have nostalgia of human traits that they could have lost due to the transformation process of becoming a demon, or from the cost of being immortal, slowly losing your memory as time passes. And there's a common trope that these human traits that they have once lost start to come back when faced with their upcoming death. Each demon has their own reasons for becoming one, and some of the more popular ones tend to reconcile and come to accept the fact that what they have done was wrong. And it's obvious that these are used as ways to not only gain sympathy points from the audience, but to also humanize these creatures, reminding us that they were once human, but just took a wrong path in life to lead them to where they are now. And in my opinion, this is definitely one of the stronger aspects of the show, blatantly showing the audience the humanistic traits of these creatures, even though they have the instinctual drive and need to lay waste to human life. And I do want to mention that whether this is incentivized mainly by Muzan is irrelevant. At least for the upper six moons, they show more loyalty to him, and have come to a consensus on what they are, showing almost no remorse for the people they eat. But sadly, aside from that, the concept of demons doesn't really go anywhere else. You could take away the tragic backstory that most of these upper moons have, and the conclusion will still be the same. After all, most of these expositions are in the form of flashbacks, implying that the characters that slayed them didn't see any of the thought process or tragic backstory the audience was just told. Most demons typically go this route. They do something terrible, they start to lose, they have a tragic backstory, then they die. Sadly, demons are used nothing more than to move the plot forward. There isn't any more insight into their psyche aside from the backstory that is provided for each one. But it's hard to blame the author given the genre that it caters to. Although the demons in the show are technically creatures that are only called monsters because of their need to eat humans, they only really feel like monsters until we're given their tragic backstory, which I believe is the biggest flaw in their design. This isn't to say that I'm completely giving it a pass. There are plenty of shonen animes that are able to diverge from this trope by starting off pretty generic, then slowly starting to turn into more of a complex show and world. But what it's worth, the anime isn't inherently bad. I just personally wish that the author had more time to really develop the idea of demons. As you can see, I'm based. I shall consider it Sigma to Phantom Tax the head of the gooner myself. Just a heads up, in this section I'm later going to be talking about manga spoilers for the series Freerun, and I'll leave a timestamp for anyone who wants to skip it. But for now, let's talk about the anime. A definition that has been constantly used to describe demons is monsters that have learned human language. Given this definition, most people may narrow-mindedly just consider them monsters, only learning human language to further facilitate their goal to annihilate humans. But as the plot progresses, you start to see that these demons have more than what meets the eye. You could really see this in full display in the manga, but because this is the anime-only section, let's talk more about the Demon Society. Just like every other generic MMO, there is a Demon King that takes control of lesser demons for world domination, or at the very least, kill all humans. What I want to focus on is the fact that these demons have a social hierarchy, morals, goals, ideas, and even have the ability and intelligence to form groups. Humans also have these traits. We have a social hierarchy, morals, goals, ideals, and the ability to band together to fight against adversaries. Hi, Lemoyne from the future here. I do want to point out that although the demons from Demon Slayer are able to band together, they only do it out of fear of Muzan. 
and I think it was specifically stated somewhere in season one, but um, I can't remember the episode and I'm also too lazy to search it up. But yeah, just another aspect that really makes me think that the demons in Demon Slayer feel more like monsters rather than creatures. But moving on. The main difference between humans and demons, and is the main aspect that forces us to dehumanize them and consider them monsters, is their instinctual desire to destroy humanity. However, this isn't a mindless goal that they do, but rather instinct that they tend to follow. This is why it's so easy to simply write demons off as monsters. But in reality, they are creatures that have the same goals as monsters. To further justify this, I want to talk about an aspect of demons that made me fall in love with this series, which is the demon's perception of power and strength given their societal hierarchy and social ladder. Just like how humans perceive appearance and wealth as a form of status, demons have a similar thing but in the form of mana. In the demon realm, they perceive mana as a form of status. The more mana you have and blatantly show, the stronger you are perceived in that society. They could care less about aspects we consider important like appearance or wealth. What matters to them is your amount of mana. In their society, mana shows how powerful of a demon you are. It shows how much easier it is to overpower other demons and how easy you can kill other humans. And their societal hierarchy was built around it. This aspect was also the only reason why Freerin was able to deceive Aura into using her curse tool. Oh sorry, wrong anime. Was able to deceive Aura into using her spell of obedience, Osirlis. It's because demons are incapable of understanding the concept of hiding one's mana, especially in this more animalistic societal structure. It's the same reason why lawyers are compelled to wear expensive clothing. When choosing someone to represent you in a legal battle, you are more likely to have more confidence in someone who dresses well, wears high quality attire, and presents themselves professionally. Freerin, given Floma's teachings, was able to take advantage of a demon's perception of mana. But enough glazing Freerin, let's talk about the demons again. What I love about this series is that it's not afraid to dwell and dive into the psyche and philosophies of creatures that we consider monsters just because of their instinctual drive to destroy humanity. And while demons are considered by definitions monsters that learned how to speak, they aren't literal monsters, but instead, creatures categorized as one because of their antagonistic nature to humanity. For anime watchers, I feel like this is more than enough to show the complexity of demons in the series, but for manga readers, you know damn well that the concept of demons goes even further. Yes, this is a spoiler warning, 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 spoiler warning, warning, spoiler warning, alright cool. Mocked, although a demon dislikes conflicts which clashes with a demon's instinctual drive to kill humanity. He also has a fascination with the human psyche. Throughout the Golden Land arc, we see this fascination in full display when going under the wing of Gluk, all for the sake of understanding humans as well as his own instincts and desires as a demon. However, this relationship with Gluk is purely transactional. Gluk is able to gain power and influence given Mok's power, and Mok is able to get a better understanding of humans through Gluk. But as Gluk gets older, his usefulness to Mok starts to fade and he eventually turns Gluk and his city into gold, looking for another person to quench his desire for knowledge of the human and demon mind. Mok is undeniably aware of his demon instincts, and he tries his best to understand human nature, but in his quest to understand humans, destroys it in the process, ironically still following his demon nature. However, he's not able to see it in that way. In his eyes, it's the only way to get to his goals. It was also his original way of trying to understand humans, asking him questions before their upcoming death, and eventually still killing them at the end, still following his instinctual desire to destroy humanity. To summarize, in order to reach this goal, he specifically antagonizes and destroys humanities without a second thought, doing it to get to his perceived goals and desires. Even in his last moments, we see he didn't learn anything, holding Gluk hostage in order to survive. No matter how much he tried, he truly didn't understand anything or overcome his demon nature. Up to his death, he has only antagonized humans. And while he did help Gluk achieve some things, let me remind you that he destroyed everything he built in the last 30 years in an instant. He isn't good, he wasn't different, he was a demon. He's a creature that was born to specifically hunt down and destroy humanity. Demons in this show are what I believe to be considered a golden standard when it comes to demon creatures, or what some people consider monsters. They're basically just people with different instinctual goals and ideals, and Freerin portrays and describes this immaculately. Surprisingly enough, I am a human. I'm not a fucking lizard. A lot of my ideals obviously do not follow the same ideals and perspective as monsters. I don't know about you guys, I per- uh.
I don't know about you guys, but I personally like living, and if I was in the same situation as the protagonist in the shows I mentioned, would probably consider them monsters too. But it's hard not to deny that the monsters in the show aren't as mindless or inhuman as we consider them to be. When implemented correctly, these monsters are just humans with different perspectives and morals, and the reason why we consider them monsters is simply because of their innate nature and tendency to clash with our ideals. What these shows provide us is how a clash of different perspectives and ideals would look like in a more fictional setting, and because it's fictionals, authors are able to play around with the instinctive natures and tendencies of a certain group of people that, at the end of the day, we consider monsters just because of those instincts, which I believe is what makes monsters and creatures awesome. But anyways guys, that's the end of the video. As per usual, we think we're just awesome. <laughs> I heard him, I heard him, I heard him. I use my ears. Elma, my beloved. <laughs> I'm the smartest star streamer in the entire world. My brain is so wrinkly, you can consider it a fucking raisin. Oh my god. Wait. Uh, if I was ever to compliment you, it would be invalid as I play games. <laughs> it wouldn't be invalid. It would mean very little to me. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be very bit little to me for a, a Genshin player to uh, compliment me. If anything, I should be complimenting them for actually talking to another human being. Okay, <laughs> oh, why did I just do that? I thought I had my pistol out. Remember? Anyways, uh, have you made the coolest swords yet? I'm getting there.